Hi there and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Kunil Seti, the Managing Partner, and Alexandra Clark, the General Partner of SCAP. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thanks, Anna. How's it going? Good. Good. Thank happy you. Thanksgiving, by the way. Or yeah. ha- rather, happy Black Friday today. Yeah, happy Black Friday. Yeah, exactly. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. Hope, Hopefully, a lot more Americans are eating less turkey. That's always a positive thing. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So, uh, Kunal, you're in uh, New York at the moment? Yeah. And Alexandra, you're in... Worcestershire. Great. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show, both of you. Um, so to start with, can you um, give me a background on SCAP? Sure. Um, SCAP basically is an institutional fund targeting more uh, later stages of typically series B and beyond companies, uh, more focused exactly on all protein or rather alternative protein. Um, climate is at the heart of how we look at companies to invest in. More so to be precise, basically between plant based, uh, cell ag, a cell ag, ingredient tech as well, and um, basically take a more of a holistic view from a tech standpoint, let's just call it food tech, basically, um, version 2.0, where it's more focused on displacing animal ag, animal protein, and advancing the whole aspect with regards to alternative protein. So typically we would look at um, series B and size companies, typical check sizes would range between three to five million up to eight million typically, where it's it's more than a proof of concept really. So more advanced stage, more growth stage, more of a cross-border approach. Luckily, with me being in the US and Ali being in the UK, I think we have that risk-taking appetite between looking at companies in the US, in uh, in Europe as well. And of course, I I think it's hard to exclude Asia where half the world's population really lives in. And I think if you look at Asia today, it has a great um, access to deal flow. And especially with uh, my background of having spent a good chunk of my life over close to a decade in Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, I think that comes in really handy to look at uh, deal flow in, in this space. But yeah, that's that's the kind of a overall view how we've structured the all protein fund. And hopefully we are targeting our, I would say our first close this quarter on the institutional side to start investing in. Yeah, and um, the S in SCAP stands for sustainable, is that right? Yes, uh, sustainable capital to uh, accelerate performance. Basically, I mean, we've gone, I've gone through a lot of versions of uh, SCAP. Um, it started off uh, in, a, in a very lame way where my last name is S, my wife's name is S, and it just came natural. And, and while I was creating this, uh, I just remember in the basement, actually, just going thanks to my cousin said, why not just uh, don't make it all about yourself and make it more around sustainable? And I said, yeah, sustainability is is or should be at the heart of what we do, basically. Yeah. So yes. And uh, how long has uh, this fund been going for now? We started raising um, late this summer, basically. So yeah. the the whole vision for both Ali and me is to kind of democratize uh, and make access to all protein, more of the institutional investors. So um, we've given the mandate uh, to an investment bank to help us with the raise. But the idea is we believe that I think all protein today is at the cusp of going viral from as an investment thesis, as an asset class. And the whole, the whole purpose objective is to get more and more institutional investors behind this. So it's kind of really heartening for instance, if you see the entry of packs into this space as well, and some of the recent IPOs that have happened in this space. Right. So uh, we we went live with our raise basically this summer on the institutional side, and I think we we made. I, I would say from a progress standpoint, I'm going to ask myself. Um, historically, it on an average it takes around for a traditional emerging fund of our size, um, it takes around 
average 15 to 18 months to get your closings in place. And the fact that I think in the six months, first six months itself, I think we're getting our first closing and starting to invest uh, yeah. pretty soon. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of heartwarming and it's really encouraging. Um, have you actually given any funds out yet to any startups or, well, I guess. Not to- as yet. Um, we've, we've finished uh, or we've completed a big chunk of our diligence. So the way we went about our strategy basically was to say, okay, do we go down the traditional route of getting our uh, fund closings in place before we start investing? And as an emerging manager, I think, especially during COVID with everything going on in the world, the idea was how do we kind of take a bit of a creative view to fast track our closing? So what we did is uh, we had some great interest uh, from some of the institutional investors who said, okay, in the essence of time, uh, rather than wait for playing catch up for the three months of lockdown that we had this summer, what if we take a deal by deal SPV strategy uh, instead of waiting to get the fund closings in place? And that's really worked wonders for us to kind of go on a deal by deal strategy into some of uh, the more mature stage deals with some of the PE funds who've shown a quite a bit of interest in uh, the some of the deals that we are planning to go into. So mm-hmm. we are hoping that we'll finish a few deals on the institutional side before the end of the year, I would say, absolutely, yeah, in the next month. Yeah, that's great. And so um, in order to encourage the growth of um, more on the seed side, uh, you've now created... Uh, Brickfee, which is your rolling contract fund. Could you tell me more about that and how you came up with that idea? I I wish I could take credit for coming up with the idea. Uh, I think for both Ali and me, this, um, I don't think, I think this just, um, it, I don't know if, I, if the right word to use, it's a matter of luck or stroke of luck. Um, we were well on course for working, focusing on the institutional side and Actually, one evening got a call from one of my friends who's a solo GP on living in um, Silicon Valley. And I think he was actually calling me to discuss, uh, just like it's happened in New York, uh, Silicon Valley today, a lot of people have actually left the Bay Area and for for a bunch of reasons. And so he was kind of like, what do you think? Should I move to New York or should I look at some of the other options, Austin? And then he, I was explaining to him what we've been up to on the raise side. And he was like, by the way, have you uh, heard about the latest uh, launch from AngelList? And having kind of been familiar with the AngelList for such a long time, I was like, I'm surprised. Actually, I haven't. And that's how the whole, uh, he explained to me the background of the rolling fund. And I think, we, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with Nawal Ravi Khan. He's um, he, someone like myself kind of really looks up to him uh, just because of the fact that how uh, he's laid out the whole aspect of using uh, the Jobs Act in terms of uh, launching the rolling fund, which was all about saying, how do you make early stage investing to um, any, anyone and everyone who has a bank account and an internet connection? and uh, basically with smaller check sizes. And so the minute I heard that, I think it just struck a chord with me because one is I strongly believe you can't have all growth stage if you don't focus on early stage. Otherwise you could suddenly create a bit, a bit of a pie in your gap from a deal flow standpoint. So if there's, a, if there's a way to kind of narrow, bridge the pioneer gap between early stage and growth stage uh, without taking on much risk as a as a solo or an emerging GP or uh, as partners for us as well. Um, it just worked great. Um, and also, I think what for me the aspect was that at the end of the day, we I think both Ali and me were very clear that we didn't want to ignore the early stage investment space. And at the end of the day, I think um, I was. Um, when Ali and we started working together, one of the things she always would ask is, okay, can we make a pivot towards things like in the beauty space, uh, which are again, non-animal focused. And I think mm-hmm. having kind of gone too far down along the way already on all protein in the food space, it was hard to make that pivot. 
and I what that was the other reason I said this could be a great way for right. even Ali to kind of be like okay now we can address the whole beauty space okay is, yeah so so other than alt, alt protein uh, you will be looking at other sectors like beauty um is there any other ones that you're looking at for and this is just for a bit free not for SCAP, right the way you're looking at other areas so the rolling fund is uh no so you have SCAP, which is institutional and pretty right. which is early stage uh mm -hmm. rolling fund i'll let ali talk a little bit i think on the genres but otherwise uh basically climate is at the heart of it from a ghg carbon methane standpoint really so food uh absolutely so all protein early stage investing clean energy so every, anything and everything to do with more on the software iot side for mobility energy storage basically uh, battery management systems um i would say even lower altitude lower levels of satellite imagery more data risk data analytics in climate really to establish cause and effect so that people stop saying that climate change is a hoax basically yeah. and and then last but not the least renewables but again more uh software focused software driven uh, than hard tech focus. But yeah, I'll, I think Ali should talk about a little bit uh, on, on the aspect of uh, beauty as well, yeah. Thank you. I've just learned that pressing space bar actually turns it on and off. It's much no, better. that's good. I didn't know that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so Prithvi is actually Sanskrit for, um, for Earth. And the thesis of Prithvi is protecting our mother Earth and the, the crises that face Earth now really the climate crisis is really the defining issue, um, but also the inhabitants of the earth. And with SCAP, we've been focusing on, on removing animals from the food chain. And of course, that's where most animals are used. I mean, the vast, the biomass of the, if you look at the data on the biomass of the earth, you know, like 60% is, is farm animals and 20% is humans and about 4% is, is wild animals. So see, that's where the, the most, um, sentience and suffering exist in the food system, but also animals are used. So it's really to remove animals wherever they're used by humans. So that's in the beauty industry, but also in the fashion and materials industry, also in the pharmaceutical industries. So there's a lot of innovation going to re um, happening right now to replace, remove animals. Um, fermentation is super exciting. So uh, the cell based work in, in the pharmaceutical space, but also looking at beauty, the, the um, consumer demand for vegan beauty products has just exploded in the last couple yeah. of years, which is really exciting. It's brilliant. And you've got more natural products, but again, then you've got the, um, the fermented, the recombinant protein products. Um, so synthesizing collagen and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and then also the material space, um, so the, the fashion industry are supportive of alternatives. It's not the same dy dynamic that you have in the food industry, which is very polarized. So actually the fashion industry are, if you can guess us a better product that has all the same functionality and doesn't involve animals and is, and is sustainable and biodegradable, from that, then we, we want it. So, you know, it, it's quite a different space. Um, it's likewise in the automobile industry, a lot of leathers used there. And it's not just leather, there are a lot of other animal products that are used. So we're really just looking at the tech that's, that's um, seeking to replace animals wherever they're used by humans in Prithvi. Yeah, so that's great that you're looking at uh, so many different uh, verticals uh, of, the, of this. And um, have you heard of a company called uh, Kinder Beauty? Um, it's from a, a lady called Ivana Lynch, who's actually an actress uh, in the Harry Potter film. So she's now created with another lady, Daniela uh, Monet, uh, to create this vegan beauty brand, actually. Um, right. So I can, I can see all these companies that are coming yeah. up now. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot happening in the space. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, it's, yeah, keeping track of all of all of these new companies that are really focusing on all organic, you know, um, bio bio uh, ingredients, but also just removing all of those animal those animal products. And I think, like I said, you've got the the natural products, but it, there's a lot because the collagen and elastin, and then there's shark shark products are used in certain beauty products. 
those kind of high-end ingredients um, that could now be produced synthetically. And that's that's where there's going to be a lot of interest from investors. Yeah. And then I guess so on the clothing side, obviously you've got not just the, you know, the clothes, but also the accessories, um, you know, all the, all the leather goods that are used there, for example, from a materials point of view. Yeah. And, and, another- and her- and hopefully we've just seen the death knell for fur anyway, because, I mean, it has been very much going in that direction lately. All the yeah. major fashion house, houses, a lot of the major fashion houses renouncing fur in in the last few years. And now with the COVID outbreaks in the mink farms, I mean, hopefully that is going to put an end to that barbaric industry. And there's plenty yeah, of alternatives yeah. and it creates an opportunity there as well. Yeah, totally. So, um, yeah, the... Uh, also, Vogue, I think, recently announced that they were they were yeah, you know, which is huge supporting, which is a huge move. Yeah, which was really mm-hmm. good. Um, but yeah, it's such a shame with with the the mink farms as well. Um, Very sad, but at least you know because obviously culling millions of, of creatures, but these these animals were going to be culled anyway. Um, so we sh- we shouldn't forget that, and, and hopefully they will be the last the last ones. Um, these farms won't be restocked afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I actually heard something about the mink farms that when when they buried all, all these minks, uh, millions of them, obviously, uh, there were some gases that came up in their stomachs and they've started to raise. Above yes, the- I the- saw the headline and I didn't get around to reading it that the mink are coming back to life and I wondered what that was. Yeah, just insane. <laughs> that like, must have scared them. <laughs> yeah, zombie minks, but as, as well as it being bad enough, them killing them, it's like... God, yeah. yeah. 2020 you wouldn't be surprised if that did happen would you yeah totally um so in terms of the uh ticket range now for these funds for Britfee, what, what what sort of uh, amount would you look to invest in in a in a startup typically i think i would say uh, average would work out to from the rolling fund uh by itself so we've started our investing process or uh, surprisingly with Pritvi, it went came about so fast. Uh, I actually wasn't even sure how soon it would come about. So we've, uh, as of last weekend, we've already started the investing process uh, out of the rolling fund for uh, Pritvi, basically. And the idea is on an average between 100 to $250,000 check sizes between seed and early stage or pre-seed, seed, early series A. And then, uh, we all Pritvi also had its own independent syndicate uh, to invest in quite a few of the deals that we've already in advanced stages of diligence in uh, the early stage space. But that's the way we've kind of modeled. So we could sometimes go all the way up to potentially anywhere between half a million to a million dollar check sizes, depending on uh, the opportunity in Pritvi. Yeah, so that's if you reach out further to the syndicates that you're working with, is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have our own syndicate, basically. So through okay. that syndicate, uh, just like on the institutional side where there are certain investors who want to come in on a deal-by-deal basis, likewise, we've taken the same approach in uh, early stage as well, where you have the fund, which is the rolling fund, and then you have the syndicates for deal-by-deal out of the same uh, syndicate, Prithvi. Yeah. And so when you're looking at startups, what do you actually look for uh, within the, uh, the entrepreneurs that you meet? Is there a certain criteria that you have in mind? Solving boring problems with interesting solutions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think some of them could be, could be uh, boring, but some of them are quite exciting, I guess. But uh... <laughs> So last night I was at um, my cousin's place. I just got home a couple of hours ago and while I was doing that uh, last time as we were talking and so I was talking to her friend and not met for a very long time, probably like a year. Yeah. And she's like, so what, what are you up to these days? I said, yeah, I'm working on climate tech. Like, so what exactly is that again? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I yeah, know it's, it's, it's boring problems with uh, interesting solutions. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, to me, I think the founder that I'd leave from um, would be a sweet spot for SCAP or for Pitri would be uh, all around climate tech, whether it's food, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, materials, beauty, regardless, but climate is at the heart of it, really. And I mean, um, I always you know, look at those founders who 
have that belief, conviction in what they are trying to achieve. Yeah, so the, their mission has to be strong, right? Uh... And as far as possible, even though sometimes it's a little cliche to say this, in early stage uh, specifically, because then by the time you grow, I think then uh, like almost saying a first mover advantage where you have minimal, if not zero competition. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, if you're taking, if, if it's always, it's, it's always appealing, I think to me personally, when I look at a founder who kind of took that bold move of trying to address a problem and saw the commercial uh, angle to it to make it affordable, basically. Because unless and until we make all these products of it, you know, lack of innovation tech is not the issue in our community or society. Mm. It's how do you make these products affordable? But somebody who said sitting in some remote parts of India, and if he or she can't afford it, you'll get your fancy financial exits. But what next? Yeah, and I think it's good that you have the the balance of knowing, you know, more than just one one industry. Like you know, if if it's looking at clean tech and and energy solutions as well as obviously the animal and uh, agriculture side of things. Um, so I think that's really important. There could be some you know. Uh, some cross synergies to some degree with with these companies say materials being used um, for fashion can also be used for automotive etc you know with those connections that you have and we've we've seen you know stock prices of even uh, electric car companies really uh, go through the roof this year um, especially now say in the UK uh, we have this green initiative uh, and then you know they're stopping petrol and diesel cars by 2030. So I think that's really important that we we also focus on on those elements from a sustainability point of view. Yeah, I mean, who, you'll see how beyond impossible go about it, but clearly they've, they've shown the future. Likewise, uh, I think Tesla has shown that it's, it's uh, people earlier thought in test five or 10 years ago, I don't think any of any of these people were even a remotely anticipated uh, Elon Musk to be the what second most second richest most powerful person uh, in mm-hmm. the world. Yeah, he's just gone up in the ranks, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, uh, was was Tesla uh, a EV company or a battery company? And today, if you look at it, I look at Tesla basically as uh, soon probably it'll be more like a lifestyle brand, actually. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they're following the reins of Apple, that's for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I think the more we focus on this, I think uh, those excuses of lack of awareness, knowledge, understanding, I think is changing gradually. And I think that's where the whole community building approach uh, for me personally, I think is super important that I think more people understand, I mean, especially the the traditional institutional investors, basically. It's good, you know, fine. Uh, everyone wants to ride, uh, recycle back some of uh, when they've had a good ride on on getting some good exit, plowing that money back uh, again in the space. But I think there's there's way too much money lying on the sidelines from as, as an investor. I say this where lack of understanding awareness holds them back to invest in this space. And I think that's where the whole community building approach is very important to get more and more of traditional investors involved in this, because at the end of the day, this is still early days. So the early stage investing risk is there, but I think the more people understand, it's like biotech. Um, As people understand the science and the tech, they get more comfortable. And likewise, the same goes, I think, for consumers as well. I think consumers are becoming more and more consciously aware. Clean labeling is a big aspect of reading what you buy before you buy it. Yeah. And um, to try and get those institutional investors to um, invest more um, into sustainability, a a key part there is education. Is that something that you're, you're, you're doing actively when you're speaking to these companies? Um, to me, I, I refer to uh, Ali as basically the, the genius or the science person in, in, in our family in, in, in SCAP and in Pritri. I think uh, her background from a knowledge, you know, how I think is, is probably the most advanced or the best amongst all of us yeah. as a team. But 
one of the things, so I started recently these uh, casual fireside chats was just for this very reason uh, is to to keep, I mean, it's just, it's just a passion hobby that I, I'm, I am anyways talking to a lot of people to kind of get them to understand and why not spread the word that way is to, you know, we call it po webinars, podcasts, fireside chats. But the idea is education awareness in this space is there's a lot of curiosity. There's a, people are curious, people are inquisitive as investors itself. But the more I think you talk about it, the more likelihood of more and more money getting deployed in this space. Yeah. So Ali, can you uh, tell us a bit more about your your background? And uh, you know, I think your background has is really helping you to to sell to these uh, institutionals. Um, yeah, I mean, just 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 to add a quick uh, note on that. I think you know there is a real shift in in attitudes, um, and we're going to see more of this because we we are about to see the biggest transfer of wealth in human history with the sort of wealth going from more of the baby boomer generation to the more millennial generation. And then the priorities in these generations, uh, these the people inheriting this money have got different priorities and don't want to just put their money into any old industry. They want to know that their money's doing some good as well. And how we actually, I mean, a really important part of that is actually how you measure the impact because it's, you know, easier to um, measure the ROI but to measure you know climate impact reduction or um, animal product displacement so we're working with um, experts and organizations on developing that metrics that startups will have to measure the impact themselves that, of their displacement of animal products because there's a equally you can just jump on the vegan bandwagon and knock another another uh, soy milk off the shelf which is not going to do anything in terms of climate impact or um, removing animals from the food system so i think that that's really important as well and i do see a shift in i think we're still uh relatively early days but in the next decade we're going to see a big shift in in um, consumer awareness and what they expect from from their investments but yeah. my background is um is more around public policy having spent 11 years in Brussels and I was head of office to the vice president of the European Parliament and um, we worked on a number of initiatives just to stimulate because this is like 2008 2009 and no one was talking there was livestock song shadow by the FAO in 2006 which really shone a light on on the emissions from from animal agriculture it wasn't really a political discussion before that um, and there was um i think it was the party for the animals in the netherlands they had released the meet meet the truth or meet the future in 2007 marianne tm and that they were sort of interviewing people on the street saying did you know climate change animal agriculture is leading to greenhouse gas emissions driving climate change and no one no one really got it mm. um so it's quite a different you know different environment back then but we worked around a number of initiatives um in in the european parliament um resolutions events we got Paul McCartney in 2009 to come and speak to the parliament at an event called Less Meat, Less Heat, it was Less Heat and that got a lot of attention at the time. Um, and then I spent five years as a lobbyist for Humane Society International, which is the international affiliate of Humane Society of the United States, one of the largest animal protection organizations in the world. And then I was lobbying the European institutions just on, on policies to incentivize the shift a uh, very frustrating work this this was you know again we're seeing a shift in attitudes but really at, at the start and the agri commission agriculture commissioner for the majority of my time as a lobbyist was um uh, irish phil hogan who a cattle farmer who was very much in denial about the impacts from the, in, the negative impacts from the industry it was quite hard work um but we're seeing i do see a glimmer of hope you know there's certainly more progressive thinking happening um uh, in terms of policy, I think here in the UK as well, next year will be a big year with the COP26 climate change conference of the parties. Um, and the, for, for me, why I'm in the space I'm in now is because 
the biggest impact, I think the most effective way of helping animals is really scaling up the alternatives because trying to just the awareness raising, although that's very, very important in policies, you know, you need the policies to incentivize a certain form of production. But unless you've got products that are affordable and tasty, then no one's going to, we're not going to have the success. So it's really a case of getting much more money. This space is far more crowded than it was even a few years ago, but it's nowhere near enough. We need much more money, much more private sector and public money poured into this space to scale up these alternatives. And I think, you know, just understanding and having a good network from the sort of more academic and policy related helps helps understand trends um, as well of the direction we're moving in and what we actually need to look out for in a startup in terms of their long term sustainability, economic, social and environmental sustainability. Yep. And you personally, you've been vegetarian since you were six, uh, mm -hmm. I think, and, but, and uh, also vegan for about 15 or 20 years. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably more like 20 now. I'm getting wow. older and in denial about that. Um, yeah, yeah. So once I learned, I, I was given a leaflet when I was out shopping with my mum from an animal rights store. So they do, that kind of campaigning does work. There is a place for it. Work, yeah. Um, you know, we need that as well. And I never really, I never liked meat. So my mum always used to try and make me eat it and I never liked it and, and tended to spit it out. But that wasn't on a sort of moral principle. That was just not liking it. But I was nearly vegan most of the time because I didn't eat eggs. I didn't eat butter or cream. I only ate cheese and chocolate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they're the only two things that I gave up when, you know, yeah. I was in my early 20s. Yeah. Um, I thought, well, it's not too far to go to go vegan actually so um and there wasn't as much awareness around being you know we were a very rare breed back then <laughs> things have I, I never would have believed you know how much things have changed and how many people are sharing the experience now because it was always quite an awkward experience by then you were kind of you knew people were going to go oh gosh you know she's hard work whereas that's changed a lot attitudes have changed now people tell me how much they're reducing their meat consumption whereas you know maybe the same people 20 years ago, uh, used to tease me a bit about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So have you ever had a debate with, uh, say, a pet owner and, uh, you know, who's a meat, also a meat eater before? And uh, I had one the other day and it, and it went really pear-shaped, but... Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, have you, have, have you ever had those connections where you say, well, you know, if you, if you love your animals and you love your pets, you should also consider... You know yeah, I used to do that a lot when I was when I was younger. I used to do that a lot because it was just obvious to me. I was like, why, why don't people, you know, there's kind of cognitive dissonance. I didn't understand how people couldn't relate the two. But and, and you know, I was I did it a lot and I used to get very emotional and upset. And now I, you know, I try and sort of steer steer clear from that because I mean, I don't know, it's just a way of communicating um that people don't want to be. I think the reason people get angry with vegans something's pricking their conference uh, you know conscience or it's just always a very delicate yeah. subject so I haven't found that that I wasn't very effective <laughs> if I'd yeah. gone and spoken to politicians and just started crying at them meat is murder I'm not sure <laughs> yeah, no, it's not <laughs> even if I, I had the t-shirt on underneath perhaps <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, uh, Kunal, um, it would be great to talk about your background. So you've also had a very interesting career. Not as fancy as Ali. We can't compete with that. My, I mean, yes and no. Um, uh, I think for me, my biggest takeaway so far has been just experiencing, I think, different cultures, if you ask me, and kind of um, having been on the other side, more from an m and standpoint, uh, I think, uh, agnostic when I look at, for instance, uh, starting off uh, with MetLife and which was more on the financial side and then having gotten the opportunity to work with European banks. Um, and I see a lot of similarities. I, I still remember my first biotech opportunity on this large molecular uh, deal that we were working at. And when you look at CELAG now, you, I see a lot of similarities. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think this, there's a lot of uh, truth to when Ali says, I think the conversation has changed uh, just in places like Europe as well, because I think Europe, uh, US tends to follow some of the trends in food, all pro 
protein really in terms of how those evolve if you look at historically and so when you look at europe now when you look at similarity between cell lag and biotech it's great um but for me i think personally having worked with european and asian institutions and even lived in places like in singapore to, to me i personally believe i think singapore has done a phenomenal job and by far it has to be i think it will be probably if not the one of the first economies countries to uh launch celag a celag uh products in the space i think we already keep seeing uh companies like shio for instance having all these great uh semi small tastings itself yeah and i think so my background i think more from an mna standpoint on the financial side um for me the biggest takeaway has been that i i look at uh bankers like ourselves who kind of so focused on the last 20 years i think whether you look at ag both upstream and downstream in terms of agri business or even clean energy 1.0 uh, a little bit of food as well and i think we we we've, we've done i think a great job when you look at okay saying um more horizontal than vertical innovation and i think we got a little too side track focused on the financial angle rather than the impact angle because had we done a better job we would have addressed to a better or a larger extent climate change or climate tech really which i don't think i think we lost focus a lot in somewhere along the way on that to the fact i think esg has been around for so long but i don't think we did a great job and to me um, I'm, i mean i take a lot of pride in saying if someone like me uh a non smart a a non intelligent banker like myself can make the transition from mainstream wall street uh investing to uh on the venture side on the impact front then i think a lot more people should take that uh route as well because we do need that support mm. and i mean so if you go back to your question on for me my the other takeaway for me has been i think to understand you know my, my granny used to say i think food is looked at in different parts of the world uh very differently so tradition wise culturally as well how someone in europe looks at food uh even as all protein and someone in the us is very different and likewise in asia as well for i think for for instance someone in india i think when it comes to all protein i think it's dairy has to be the game changer if somebody can master that i think we are in business there there's no stopping india then likewise i would say in in china it has to be meat or pork really i mean if you uh, having kind of lived in asia and if you are during whole lunar new year or chinese new year if you are in china and if you um you know just can change and i think it's happening but to me i think that's one of the things for me has been has experiencing these cross cultural aspects of how different cultures different people look view the financial play and the climate play differently and i think one of the things that i want to uh, i always wanted to be like okay what kind of fund do i want to invest in and the beauty about i think what ali and me are creating now is that with her being in europe me being in the us and with my asian uh, experience expertise from the mna side both in uh, energy and agri space as well i think is to get more and more of the pensions and endowments the private equities of the world to invest more and more in this space whether it's upstream downstream regardless So yeah, that, uh, yeah that's no as I saying that's that's really important because we we need that those bigger institutional checks to come in and i never realized this on i'll be lying if i were to say oh i absolutely i remember ali pointing this out to me uh, early this year when our patch crossed uh, after a call that we had through the provage incubator and she pointed out to me that i think it's come it, it there comes a point in time where fund managers who are looking at this space have to evolve uh, my make that transition beyond going to that 
same smaller pool of investors because that's going to you know it's like it's like a natural resource on this planet if you keep taking out taking out at some point that's going to finish off basically you need a bigger bigger pool of money of investors to invest in this space to grow it exactly. and so so for me i think the big the biggest value that i bring to the table is one is of course i come from the traditional m and a world but um i look at investing a lot more emotive with a lot of emotions and you know any anyone who says oh uh, in, you know you got to separate money and emotion i'm like i don't think so mm. uh, you can't because at the end of the day if you are not driven by what you invest in um you're not really going to put in a lot of money in there and if it's not if it's successful you're going to brag about it to your neighbors to somebody in your community saying hey I made that good amount of money uh, on that all protein fund company. You should look at that as well. That's how I look at investing actually in this space. Yeah, totally. Um so where do you think over the next uh, few years this this industry is going to be going uh, from an investment point of view and the sectors? Uh you've already spoken a bit about the markets that you want to see changing especially with dairy etc. Um but what does the next few years look like? Uh, and what does that look like for you I mean personally I would probably start off by answering that saying that thanks to people like Seba on the spacs that he uh the spac that he recently had a great success I think we're going to have a lot more spacs coming into this space I think we're going to have a lot more successful IPOs happening in this space and um I think this industry is going to basically explode I think this space is absolutely going to explode like crazy there's no stopping this space um just the amount of money that i'm seeing whether it's whether it's in the us whether it's in canada itself whether it's in asia or even in europe now mm. so both ali and me are trying to look at from like there are a lot of startups there are a lot of founders and that's what makes our job a little more challenging and i kind of welcome that challenge is what's the next everyone wants to know what's the next impossible beyond oatly's or perfect days of the world to invest in but to me what personally really fascinates me is saying okay but what what's the ne- how we actually we keep having all these great products but unless and until the manufacturers of the world don't make this transition you can keep, keep focus on the best molecule uh, molecular approach in cell ag a cell ag but if the traditional manufacturers ain't going to make that transition that means we just got to go out there and start building new uh manufacturing plants uh, or finding new ways to actually manufacture all these products and to me those whole bioreactors of this world basically that space it's something that i think has to be a more, a bigger stronger focus for investing in because that's how i think that's that has to be addressed uh for all these startup founders as well and second is also finding better more economic making supply chain making distribution easy in terms of i should be able as as a i should i should be able to just go across to my grocery or somewhere nearby just to and and be able to buy access to these products it has to be simpler and easier and affordable you know i i i think that my my personal dream is to ensure that these products are affordable no matter which part of the world i think all for all protein to be successful as an industry it can just be looked at in the western world it has to be easily accessible to all to each and every person no matter which part of the say emerging economies or countries of the world basically so that is something that really uh, gets me out of bed if you ask me every day great fantastic So yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um great to hear about the the new launch of the the Rolling Fund 2 and uh yeah, I look forward to seeing what investments that you're making into the space and and seeing these companies grow as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you and uh see you again soon. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Thanks Anand. Have see a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.